we're first going to talk about the choppy macro environment we're in, and then we'll get to a little later in the conversation, Bridgewater secret sauce, what it takes inside the investment process for you guys. But starting with the macro environment here, it's been a tough year. And very recently, you've actually also told Bloomberg that the equity market itself has a ways to go when it comes to a drawdown. So when you look at kind of the grand array of risks in front of us, which are the ones that investors today are the most misunderstood? Yeah, well, when I look at markets, like all investors are thinking different things, but you can kind of aggregate market sentiment just by looking at what's priced in and comparing what you think will happen relative to that. And so I think the biggest mistake priced into markets right now is the belief that we're going to return to essentially pricing similar to pre-COVID, that inflation is expected in markets to come down to a little under 3% over the next 18 months or so, and that um, that'll happen without much of a recession. So earnings are priced to continue to grow um, at a relatively normal rate from here. So I think that is probably the biggest mistake being priced in, which is things can revert normally, that we've had the drawdown and the worst is behind us. I think that's actually a mistake. We're still in the early phase of dealing with a radically different world than we had pre-COVID, a world that's deglobalizing rapidly, that's definancializing in certain ways, that is short, still doesn't have enough energy in a lot of places in the world for relative to economic conditions before, and we're working our way through that process. And so just like the phase, you have a 30-year phase from 1982 to 2008 of lower interest rates and higher private sector debt. You had a phase from 2008 basically up to COVID of the shift of private sector debt onto the government balance sheets through quantitative easing. And then you have fiscal policy and monetary policy come together to create an explosive mix of demand outstripping supply post-COVID that led into this inflationary environment which is a challenge for policymakers where they no longer can get what they want, which is essentially low inflation and reasonable growth, and therefore they're constrained, and the markets aren't pricing for how constrained policymakers are, how actually impossible what markets expect, reasonably good earnings growth and low inflation to come in a combination are. So I'd say that's the biggest mistake. Well, it's interesting because before a lot of these issues even came to the forefront, there was a podcast that you had hosted by Ted Seides and you had a very dire outlook. You said the world is bad for investors going forward. That was before the start of the war. That was before the shift in a lot of the Federal Reserve policies. And a lot has changed, as we said, since then. To what extent do you think that the job of policymakers will get even harder moving forward with some of these great unknowns? Yeah, well, when I was talking about that in the middle or in end of last year, in 2021, the basic picture was becoming more and more obvious that the inflation problem was caused by demand, not just supply, that the, the Fed combination of macroeconomic monetary policy and fiscal policy had created this thing that was, the Fed was going to have to face. It was interesting how long it took for the market to price that in. What we were expecting all through 2021 really played out in the first two quarters of 2022. But this is the early phase, that you actually don't face the dilemma yet. You have a 3.7% unemployment rate. It's easy for the Fed to talk tough about inflation. What I think will happen um, going forward is you're going to have inflation staying stubbornly higher than, than markets are expecting as growth starts to turn down. That's when it gets really tricky, and that's what's going to create, in our view, sort of the, the more risky part of the downturn when it becomes clear that earnings are falling and rates are still not falling and rates are rising. Um, that's the period, if you look at history or whatever, that when you, when you can't get what you want, um, you face that. And even worse, in places like the UK and Europe, where you're simultaneously battling currency weakness, economic weakness, and inflation problems. And, um, and I think that, that the downturn feels big relative to the long wave of assets rallying, but in the historical standards, asset prices are still quite high, that decline is quite small, and relative to the change in the underlying fundamental conditions, in our view, there's a lot more to come. So that, and it'll get scared when, scary when everybody thinks it's 
not a temporary blip, but a, a more permanent phenomenon, that's when the bottom will start to come in. Well, yeah, I mean, even into the end of this year, there are, are a lot of risks, right? You, you are seeing an energy crisis in Europe today, but weather is not as bad as it could get. Uh, you're seeing the midterm elections in the United States that could create even more risk. I mean, how do you bake in some of these things that you may know are going to happen and then calculate that back into your investment thesis? I mean, which of the forces are the most important for investors to be considering in the next six months if you believe things are getting worse? Yeah, well, I think the, the big picture cycle, right, that there's these big cycles happening and those smaller cycles happen. The big cycles include the fact that we've, we've pushed the world. We had such a private sector focused world that hit its limits in terms of corporate power, wealth distribution, et cetera, and that you've moved to a more government controlled economy and a more government controlled world. These things happen in phases. Those big trends of monetary and monetary easiness, printing of money, fisc fiscal spending increasing, leading to a higher inflation. And at the same time, those big trends include the deglobalization after a 40-year globalization wave going through deglobalization, Russia coming offline, China more and more becoming isolated, at least from the Western countries. These are the big trends that really matter, right? Then there's the timing things of what will be the particular trigger of the next wave. It could be the election. It could be some other thing, whether in the winter or whatever. But that, that I wouldn't get too focused on unless you're trading for month and month kind of gains. The bigger picture is you have a very different environment, a deglobalizing, definancializing, higher government world that, um, that you have to be prepared for as an investor. And that's where the, you know, I think it's easier to see over the next two years than it is whatever the triggers will be over the next month. Well, I think that also begs the question, you mentioned that the worst may not um, have yet been seen. So what does the worst case scenario look like and how long do you believe that whether it's just the US or whether it's the globe will be facing a tough economic environment ahead, particularly for investors? How long does it go on for? Yeah, well, it's, it depends a lot on how policymakers play and, and a lot of randomness in that, right? A typical cycle though in an inflationary environment is much longer downturns because policymakers can't respond as they normally would to a downturn. So if you look at history, this would normally be something like a three-year recession rather than a sharp, fast one because the policy response will be slower to the downturn that's emerging. And so I would expect it to be longer. Now, it depends. You, the, the range on those often, is there a big shock? Does it happen in one big, do you get a crash and a quick, a quick downturn in deflation due to that crash, in inflation due to that crash? Or does it get expanded out? I think history would suggest this type of environment is probably longer, more grinding than a crash. But, um, but, but it, it depends on that. So it's not easy to say, is it three years or, or one year? But what the magnitude of it is likely to be large and difficult. And that I think you could say with more confidence than you could, uh, than you could for how fast, because it really depends how sharp. It is. Now let's hone in to a region of the world. Let's hone in on Europe in particular. Given the energy crisis, given that we've reported over and over that Bridgewater does have that short position in European stocks, uh, given the proximity to the war, how do you believe that this plays out over the next six to 12 months? How do you believe that the economic picture changes in Europe? And do you believe that some of these changes will be permanent? Well. I don't think anything's permanent, but I think that Europe's economy is much more so than the US based on manufacturing and, rel and having access to the energy, particularly in Germany, that they had. This is a big jolting shock, like in the end, bigger and more lasting than COVID was for sure. And, um, and it has so many different um, aspects of it, most of them negative. You have the, the fact that it's going to ripple through not just the energy intensive manufacturing, but all of those inputs, the, the impact it has on disposable income, the income it has on exploding government budget deficits as they try to offset the effect on, on households. So you're going to see a lot more bond issuance into a slowing economy and pretty much a mini balance of payments crisis is going on and potentially a large one in the UK's case. And um, that is a very different dynamic than we're used to in the developed world, where short rates have to rise because of the inflation and currency problems while the economy's collapsing. Now, we've seen that. That obviously happens often in emerging economies. And it has happened in the UK before, but not you got to go back to the 70s. But the idea that, that 
the UK kind of experiment here, which is, all right, we're going to fund the households on their electricity and we're going to do this. That experiment's been tried, that you can print money into a rising inflation environment to offset the negative effects, and odds are it fails. Uh, we'll see every, every loop through these things, you learn something. But that formula is quite dangerous, and the balance of payments challenges that it face. And Europe also faces these terrible choices. In the end, to handle a crisis like this, you either have to crush demand through higher interest rates and lower asset prices, or ration demand through a very strong government hand. Both of those are politically very difficult things to do. Um, so they face this incredibly bad dilemma that the markets are still kind of looking past. And it, it, it takes a lot to say that. Markets are, are really good. It's super hard to create alpha. But if you look at how COVID kind of came as a wave and really the market reaction didn't happen until it landed in the U.S., that, um, that if you take last year where the problems of inflation and everything were so obviously building and the markets didn't react until this year, it does seem like there's a decent chance that the market's not going to react to the European crisis until it's deeply upon us, which I think is the next couple months. But that, um, that, that does seem to be the case, despite the fact a lot of people are talking about it. It's not like we're unique in talking about it. Many people are talking about it. But, the, but if you look at the market pricing, the market pricing hasn't adjusted, mainly because so many of the holders of assets are so permanent. They're so index-based. They're not reacting mm -hmm. to even changing conditions that are right in our face. So for the investors that have kind of either rushed to the dollar or believe that U.S. stocks are any sort of safe haven bid, what do you say to those investors? Is it naive to believe that the problems of Europe won't spill in to the United States? Well, A, directly the problems of Europe will spill in because U.S. corporations need Europe. You have a shrinking world in a sense of Russia's offline, China's less online, et cetera. Europe's obviously critical to U.S. corporations, 50% of which revenues are outside of the U.S. So, A, of course, the U.S. can't avoid that. Beyond that, the U.S. has its own incredibly difficult problems. And probably the worst thing for the U.S. is it's priced to be the best. So the U.S. is priced in to be the greatest economy, to be the best economy going forward, and not to have major problems. That U.S. pricing, as I said before, inflation is going to fall quickly to 2.7, no recession, no problem. Other countries are at least pricing in problems. Here in the U.S., we don't have that. And the U.S. assets are the most elevated, in part because the companies have been best performing, but, but also because the liquidity post-COVID got stuck in the United States. So much money was printed, it didn't go all over the world the way it did post-financial crisis for reasons I won't take the time to get into now. But the U.S. is the center of the bubble, of the financial bubble, and it is um, the most at risk of the pulling of liquidity that's happening now at an increasing pace. And just as the liquidity creation by the Fed pushed assets up much faster than the cash flows in the real economy, the liquidity reduction is pulling the money from the assets that need liquidity. Any asset that doesn't generate its own cash flow to support essentially its improvement in like its ability to go up as an asset requires new liquidity. You take most extreme are assets like cryptocurrencies or whatever that don't, take, that don't create any income stream it requires new liquidity in order to get a new buyer, right? And similarly, in some stocks, something like 40% of the U.S. stock market require new liquidity in order to drive up their prices. Without new liquidity, their prices fall. So, um, and that's a big trend in markets, the difference between the assets that actually can generate the cash flows to support themselves versus the assets that require new investors. Given that grand disconnect that you're talking about, and especially with the U.S. being kind of the center of the financial bubble, as you say, does that require you to be net short to express that view of the world? Well, I think you have um, different ways to invest, right? There's trying to be a long-term investor in what the best asset allocation is, and, and those people should be invested in not trying to take even year, three years, five years. you got to know that your assets could go down for five years. But to have a consistent return stream, to make money in bear markets, and bear markets, even though there have been so few of them and they've been so short over the last 30 years, they can go on for a long time. You can be in Japan and you can have a 20, 25-year bear market. You have to know that's a possibility and you have to prepare for that. Now, of course, in Bridgewater Shoes, one of the reasons I love it is we don't have to be long. We don't have to, our, our, our fate does not hinge on what the equity market or the bond market does. It hinges on our ability to predict what the next shoe to drop is. We're just as easy for us to make money when assets go up or assets go down. And certainly in this environment, 
the environment I expect to last for several years at least, then the, being able to be short, being able to create a return stream that doesn't require assets rising is so critical and, and allows you the opportunity to prosper no matter what the outcomes are. So that's the part that I love is the Bridgewater secret sauce, bringing us into your investment process. I learned something this weekend about Bridgewater that made me feel quite inadequate. <laughs> it's that you read 600 pages every weekend before you come into work every Monday morning. What is in that 600 pages that you discuss every Monday morning that helps you make decisions? You know, what is something that maybe you guys talked about today that made you see the world differently? Well, I think, I mean, if I generalize the secret sauce in the, in the best way is, A, we have a, been for 42 years at the hard work of writing down a game plan for every event, of thinking through what are the, how would you want to react if there's a war, if, if inflation rises to this, if growth does this, if gold does that, how do you react to all of those things, right? And, and having translated that into decision rules that we use to trade mar the markets, the great benefit is we can spend all our effort on what are we missing, right? And that, that's what, if you talk about the, what's going on in the world packet that we do every, every Monday, 600 pages, it's everything that we're thinking we might be wrong about it. We call it our radar because it's like blips on the radar, radar that could sink the ship. And that leads you to all of these things that we're dealing with that maybe aren't well systemized. Um, so if you deal with the deglobalization and what that means, or you're dealing with the energy crisis in Europe, while we have processes that attempt to deal with these things, living through it in real time, you see, well, I haven't thought about this, I haven't thought about that, I haven't thought about, okay, the UK does the government check in a certain way to offset that. All of those things become things that you say, okay, now I gotta work on building those into my process. And then over 42 years of compounding that, because we had the discipline to write it down, translate it into algorithms, and keep improving those algorithms, you know, it, it takes a long time, but you've suddenly got this incredible process. And that's how we make decisions. We make decisions on a daily basis using the process that we've built and that we focus all of our energy on what we might be missing and then building that into our process. Well, I mean, that goes to show that over decades, you do have some things where you can build upon the data that you've started collecting the data for for decades and are now able to systematize. But for the, all of the things that are on your radar that you can't systematize, which are you most worried about? What is the thing that you need to really start preparing for for the next five to 10 years? Yeah, well, almost everything that we do, it started out seeming non-systemizable. But your brain, somehow you're making decisions in your brain. And all we mean by systemization is forcing you to take out of your brain what you want to do so other people can examine it, so you can stress test it the best you possibly can. And, um, and so I do think a lot more is systemizable than you might believe if you follow that process. We don't start with, well, what data can we get now with systemize? We start with what problem do we face? How do we get the relevant data so that we can make good quality decisions about that problem? So right now, like the studying of this deglobalizing geopolitical world, that's a huge challenge. How do, you, how do you get the data necessary to understand that? If you take the impact of the growing impact of fiscal policy and regulatory policy across the world. China's been this great laboratory of massive regulatory policies, driving economies, et cetera. We've taken a lot of that learning and translating that as countries become, as governments become more proactive in economies, that, um, that we have to get the data to do those things. So I'd say the biggest areas of concern right now are the geopolitical risks, are the risks associated with, let's say, government higher government involvement in economies, and how do you build that out, those types of things, gather the data you need to make wise decisions associated with it, put those into processes that you could stress test, and then manage so that you're not making spur of the moment decisions, but you're actually handling those things. And so being prepared and systematically for things like what if there's a conflict over Taiwan, et cetera, having built out a process to deal with those things beforehand rather than trying to react at the time. Now, I wanna talk about a couple of your products over at Bridgewater because you have the all weather fund, which you've once described as never the best performing asset, but it's always pretty good. And then there's a the pure alpha fund. So when you're talking to investors about what they need, what they want to invest in, the hedge fund in the most traditional sense of the world and that protection over those tough things that can happen in the world or pure alpha, what is it that they want more today? Of. Well, I think most investors, like what Bridgewater did, which is an important thought that now more people agree on, but is separating your strategic asset allocation 
from what we call alpha, from your timing decisions, right? And um, all weather reflects a strategic asset allocation, our best thinking on that. And pure alpha reflects all of the timing decisions. So pure alpha, lot, like it takes a lot more energy, a lot more time to uh, bridge water than all weather, where it's kind of like, okay, you create a great balanced portfolio and you have that. Pure alpha is understanding what's next to drop over the next six to 18 months and how we could be ahead of those things. And so they're very different. Most people need a mix. They need a good strategic asset allocation and then they need to know how to deviate from that strategic asset allocation in a disciplined way. So I'd say that they, they both just serve very different purposes. Now, we know you've been fairly bearish on things in the next couple of years, but before we leave everybody, I think it's worth asking, what's the biggest opportunity that you see over the next year? Well, I think um, there are places in the world, we won't go into our positions per se, but there are places in the world that are having very different cycles than the US, the UK, Europe are. And I think that it's interesting, actually, a lot of places in Latin America where they've had much more disciplined monetary and fiscal policy than the U.S. have a lot of opportunities, have a lot of what the developed world needs, have been held back by the lack of investment due to COVID and other things that made it more difficult. So I think there's areas there that are look relatively attractive. It's difficult into a tightening world and a world of rising risk premiums and declining liquidity. It's going to be difficult everywhere. But I think there's areas there. There's certainly areas in commodity assets that particularly that have been underinvested in that are less um, growth sensitive that are um, also reasonable longs as well. And just coming back to the thing I was saying before, there's a big difference between equities that generate the cash to support their asset values and the equities that require the ongoing liquidity. So the, the first category we think you could still own reasonably attractive prices. And the second category is what is you know, most at risk in this type of environment. We will leave Bitcoin on the table for next year. Okay. <laughs> the cash flow question. But thank you so much, Greg, uh, for your time. And thank you all for listening.